Hi, I'm Professor Michelle Barber and welcome to the Enterprise Sessions. Today, I'm speaking with Professor Mahmoud Mostafavi, who is Director of the Southwest Nuclear Hub. Mahmoud, welcome. Thank you so much for making the time to talk to me. My pleasure. Thank you so much. I understand that part of your role is working with one of our key partners, EDF Energy. So perhaps you could tell me a little bit about how that came about and what is it we do with EDF? I think it started, at least I was made aware, aware of it uh, some time ago when I was a student oh. in around 2009. We are trying to help them mm -hmm. to ensure our power plants run smoothly so everybody can have electricity. This started when you were a student. Correct, yes. And now you're obviously a senior academic working at quite a different level. So how has your interaction with EDF changed over that 10, 15 year period? I guess the funny thing about it was a lot of the students at the time, now they are senior managers in EDF. So the person who was sitting right next to me doing his PhD at the same time as me, now he has to make decisions on how to do things. And well, I guess we know each other well, we understand the issues and uh, because of that interpersonal relationship, the mutual understanding of what is it that the university is for and what is it that industry needs from university, this partnership works well. And it's really interesting that some of the, the guy you sat next to in your PhD days has gone on to work for EDF and I think that you said there's a few examples of that. You stayed in academia, so what do you, the academic, get out of this partnership? What, what motivates you to work with EDF? I don't think I'm lying when I say I'm an absolute geek. So I really would like to sit in the corner, do my models and not talk to too many humans. <laughs> However, doing that doesn't give us the satisfaction of seeing what we produce in action, mm -hmm. making a difference, making an impact. So seeing what we do actually make a difference in industry, turns into electricity at some point, is what, what motivates us. And are you now supervising the, that next generation of students that you know, maybe in 10, 15 years I'll be interviewing them? Oh goodness, they are so clever. I look at them and I put myself in their shoes and I think I did not understand anything at your level when I was your age. For you, it sounds like a lot of the motivation is about realizing the impact of your research, taking your, your insight and your expertise and applying it in a sort of what we might loosely call the real world context. What about the motivation for EDF? Why do you think they work with us at the university? What, what do they get out of that relationship? We have worked really hard for more than a decade with EDF to understand them. And that has built a trust. They trust us when we do our differential equations, still in the background, we are trying to fix one of their problems. So that trust, that mutual understanding that I understand your issues, trust me, I will deliver for you. I would like to think that's one of the main motivators of EDF because they know we can translate our pure scientific endeavors into something tangible that they can use. I absolutely hear what you're saying about trust. I think that's really key. And the partnership with EDF, as you, as you note, is, is quite a well-established one. What are your thoughts on how we can get to that position of trust? Um, there's a certain amount of time it's going to take, but are there ways we can reach out and interact with new partners to get to that position of trust and mutual understanding efficiently? I think we just have to be patient. Mm. It's not discovering something amazing today and going to a company and saying, buy it from me tomorrow. It's, it's, it's showing to them during the course of years, why is it that what we do is useful for them? Start small, start a master's project, then go to a PhD project, then small contract, then we can go to uh, our funders in the government and say, could you please help us work better with these industrial partners that we know really well now. So it can start as something quite modest even and then, and then grow on the base of the success of those sort of smaller projects? Yes, and understanding their issues. It's, it's not about us, it's about the partnership. We, we can provide things for them if we understand their issues and understanding that issues takes time, takes patience, and we have to admit we need to learn from them, you know, 
They, they know that they are running a reactor. They know how to run. I don't think I know how to run a reactor. It's not your job I'm to know how to run a reactor. I'm pretty sure I do not know how to run a reactor. So, I mean, you, you sort of touched on my next question already a little bit, but um, as you say, a lot of partnerships can grow from, you know, maybe individual projects, maybe student projects or, or small projects involving staff and then grow into a, a true partnership. What would you classify as the difference between a partnership relationship and one where it's a more simple sort of, you know, sponsor a research project, for instance? I think it's the long term aim that matters in, 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 in a partnership. If you were running a project, it would be very industrial, I would like to think. There are deliverables, we work towards it, we deliver it, it finishes. Three years, five years, whatever it is. When it's a partnership, you have to think long term. What is it that, the com where is the company is going? What do they need in 20 years? How can I steer the group, the team of the researchers in a way that is going to be useful for that company in long term? Even if it means that I need to get resources from elsewhere to make sure that I'm aligned with them. So that alignment of the goals mm -hmm. is more of a partnership than a project which is well defined, starts, finish, deliverable relationship. Sometimes end that. <laughs> and I guess for that to really work, to an extent, you and your research group can align yourself to your partner's goals. But I guess you wouldn't do that if your goals weren't also sort of in common or at least in parallel. Absolutely. So it's that synergy of, of goals that are that actually overlap. Would that yes. be fair? Absolutely. It's I guess I guess it's more of where is it that that scientific curiosity mm. meets industrial demand? When they meet, goals are aligned. Then you have to put the aim is the same. The objective should be worked out between the two to make sure that we get there. Both of us to a satisfactory destination. We are happy because we have done our geeky things. They are happy because they have done one of, uh, they have solved some of their industrial problems. And those things can absolutely coexist. It is amazing how they can be really close. It's not dumbing down the science. It is not selling out. It's really interesting that what we are doing now is pure valuable science. And then because of that understanding, we can translate it into something that EDF can use. It's not um, changing your um, integrity, your scientific curiosity. It's understanding how they overlap the industrial need and the science. Fantastic. So Mahmoud, so far, a lot of my questions are focused on the, the researchers yourself and your team. But I would imagine from everything you described, it's quite a complex relationship and you would need support from professional services staff. So where have you got that support? Where have you needed that? I think University of Bristol's ecosystem is really well suited for this. We are really good at doing things that are impactful. And that takes everybody. It's not just the senior management team saying that this is the research we, are, we want to do. It's at every level. Professional services are helping, telling me what a, a responsible research is when I have no idea. Uh, the head of a school is supportive. The head of research group is supportive. At every level, there is support available to help you to translate what you are trying to do into a good proposal, into a good partnership, into a good project, and then translate that into an impactful research. So um, everybody helps. It's really interesting you say that because I mean, you and I's journeys have been very different. You're involved in this partnership with this huge company. I formed a spin out. They couldn't be more different. And yet I found exactly the same. You need that support right the way from your manager and your head of school to you know, the senior management to the people in, in our sort of enterprise services. So our, our sort of experiences converge a little bit there, I think. If there's one example you could give, what would you like one of the lasting impacts to be? What would you like the, the outcome to be of some of the work you do with EDF in, a, in sort of almost layman's terms, I suppose? I would like some of the work that we are doing with EDF to be applied to other companies. Hmm. Right now, we do have an energy crisis and we are going to have various companies doing a lot of work in this area. And what we do with EDF to make sure that nothing breaks or things run as smoothly as they should. If, I, if we can apply what we have done with EDF, 
which to be fair to them has taken a lot of their resources and intellectual properties into develop what we have done and be able to help others achieve the same goal, I would say my job in academia is done. We, have, we are right now talking to Royce Royce, to UK Atomic Energy Authority who are doing fusion. They're all about high temperature. The, the work that Royce Royce is doing with the space is really fascinating. I would like to some of my work to be applied to uh, going to Mars. <laughs> he wouldn't. <laughs> and that leads really nicely on where I want to take this because when I introduced you, I said you're the director of the Southwest Nuclear Hub. And so you don't only work with EDF, you've had and continue to have relationships with other companies. So maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that. Maybe you might talk a bit more about space. I don't know. Uh, well, I would like to talk about fusion. Okay, let's talk about fusion. <laughs> because I really feel that UK is a unique place to have the first working fusion reactor in the world. And that will be an unlimited, almost unlimited green energy that solves a lot of the crisis around us. However, as good as the people at the UK Atomic Energy Authority are, I think they are going to need a national initiative, academia and an industry, to achieve that goal. And I would love to play a tiny, tiny role in that. If I can just make sure there is no weld breaking in their fusion power plant, I will be happy. <laughs> what needs to happen to get us to that vision of yours, sir? I think we are almost academically there. It needs a national initiative. It needs all of us lining up and helping them on every aspect because the issue is that it's a very extreme environment. The irradiation damage, the, the mechanical loads, the um, uh, pulsating plasma, they are so complex and hasn't been seen before. It's very much like our Wright's brother moment mm -hmm. that we do not know at all what computational fluid dynamics is, but we have to fly the, we have to fly the airplane. So I think, I think we have to take a leap of faith and build a nuclear fusion reactor and hope it's going to work. If you were to look back at the Mahmood in that, in that PhD office, sitting with your other PhD colleagues and so on, what advice would you give your younger self? What would you say, knowing what you know now? Talk to more people, learn from them. Everyone in that office is at the top of their field and they know a lot. So that is a unique opportunity to learn about lots of different things. Don't have your blinders on. Don't just look at your problem. Go and talk to everybody. You never know where your solution is going to come from. It might be biomechanics. And what about even, I don't know, 10, 20 years before that, what would you say to the young Mahmoud about the career path that you might have considered, you know, when, when you were young? Was this what you pictured? Was this what you wanted or? Is it too bad if I say don't, don't bother planning because goodness knows <laughs> where the world takes you? <laughs> no, I think that's great advice. <laughs> no, plan, but let the world take you where it wants to. I think there's a value in following stuff that you find interesting, right? My son sometimes says to me, I don't know what to be when I grow up. And I say, neither do I, you know, I'm just doing what I like. Doing what you like, that's, that's a very good point. Yeah, do what you like. So you talked about uh, your peers and your students um, and, and your colleagues at EDF and your relationships with them. Has there been anyone in your career so far that has sort of um, helped you shape your ambitions? Anyone perhaps that you've, you've worked with has more experience than you that's, that's helped you sort of clarify where you want to go with your work? I think having a mentor is incredibly important in this journey. I have had many bosses and I owe them all of them a lot. They have been all teaching me amazing things and I'm forever grateful. But I think for me, it's the tale of two Daves, <laughs> uh, both directors of the High Temperature Center who sat me down and told me, you're going to sit here and you're going to learn from me. I don't care what you want to do. You are going to sit there and learn. And I think everybody at some point needs that. They need a mentor to teach them because you learn from them, not just from their success, but from their mistakes. And if they're comfortable with you, they tell you where they went wrong. And knowing where not to go is as important as knowing where you want to go. 
I think for a mentoring relationship to work, both parties have to be really honest. You have to be prepared to show your, your soft underbelly, just to show where you've got things wrong. And you shouldn't have a thinner skin. You should be prepared to be told off. You know, I, I learn every time I get told off. Is this something you do now? Are you a mentor? I would like to think so, but I would like to think I'm softer than, than, my, than my mentors. They, they hammered me into shape. Yeah. I try to shape people nicely rather than hammering them. Mahmoud, I'm so grateful for all the time you spared for me today. And I think your insights and your reflections will be useful to a really wide range of people, whether they're involved in a partnership or whether they're considering where their small industry collaborations might lead in the future. So thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you so much for your time. If something you've seen today has piqued your interest and might be relevant to your research, please do feel free to contact us and enjoy the rest of the enterprise sessions.